Oh, the, there's more, more than two. Uh, let's uh, try to give it this. Embrel, uh, Yumira, um, uh, uh, Urbitux. Uh, I think there's about 20 drugs uh, that are protein-based on the market right now. Um, so we could we come back because of the research since the name for getting Oh, those have been uh, uh, sort of in development sort of in concurrent with that, that process happening. Um, Very few since the genome project. Yes. I think, I think one of the hypes is that, I mean, for anyone who was around in 2000 when Clinton and Blair made the statement about um, sequencing the genome, I think one of the hypes has been, it's been quite disappointing that as a society, you sit there, all that money's been spent on it, what's actually come out. Yeah. And, a uh, huge amount of basic science has come out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. but, and uh, very little for us to invest right. in. Yeah. Um, I personally think that's changing, but I suppose that's sort of one of the things that we're discussing now in terms of perhaps I'll bring it sort of back to maybe diagnostics. Because obviously developing drugs takes a long time. Yeah. Even if you can discover the perfect drug, it's going to be seven years in the clinic before it gets to the market. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if we come back to proteins, have been used as markers of disease for many, many years. If I think of uh, uh, PSA for prostate cancer, it's not a very good marker, but it sells about $300 million and it's used all over the world. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me when we're looking at sort of protein science in terms of clinical applications, diagnostics should be the first things that start popping out. Mm -hmm. So where are we? Where, where are the first diagnostics? Yeah, maybe that's a question for me. Uh, the first thing I think are the monoclonal antibodies uh, as protein therapeutics and also the, the, um, the recombinant proteins, other recombinant proteins that are used therapeutically. Uh, biomarkers, as you say, have a very long history, but if anything, it's grinding to a halt. We, we're now in a very, high, I'll get back to that in my presentation. We have a problem that there's very little coming out currently. Paradoxically, we know so much more about what proteins there are, but uh, the n numbers of new biomarkers uh, is dwindling and uh, uh, Lee Anderson has projected that uh, uh, it'll hit uh, zero in uh, a few years' time. <coughs> um, I don't think that's how it's going to happen, but certainly, uh, I think we're going about it in the wrong way, and uh, that, that's a big problem. There is a potential, tremendous potential uh, uh, in biomarker. Uh, it should be relatively low-hanging fruit, less complicated, uh, and uh, it could have a tremendous uh, therapeutic benefit. We know that uh, if we can find a disease early on, then we have a good chance of doing something about it. If we have a patient with metastatic disease, then we can come up with drugs that prolong life for months, but not much better than that. So uh, the therapeutic value of early diagnostics is fabulous, but uh, I think it's been quite disappointing so far. Again, I'll say some more about that, but please. I was going to ask you, why is it? Where, is it, is it a lack of right. sort of inertia? Because people maybe are, there's a, there's a kind of, maybe people are more interested in just trying to find quick fixes for drugs and big pharma with big companies. Right. I, we discussed this a uh, little before. I, I think it's to some extent a sociological problem. I, I, in some ways, uh, proteomics is now being recreated by people who did genomics before and using the tools of genomics in some form and high priorities given to high throughput when the actual quality of the data is not sufficiently good. There's no point building tremendous uh, databases and looking in the same shallow pond of proteins. You need to go much deeper. That's going to be, that's my hobby horse, and I, I have a very biased view on this, perhaps. <coughs> but uh, I, I think the approaches being taken now, and that I see a lot of money being poured into approaches that I think may not take us where we want to go. Uh, so I think we'll have to back up and think more carefully about how really to go deep into the proteome. And then I, I'm pretty optimistic that it will be possible to find interesting new markers, and I'll show one example. I would uh, just like to comment there that I think that uh, the, the financing for diagnosis has not been, uh, it's, it's not really there. I mean, the, the venture capital, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Previously, they have been very interested in, 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 in this drug development and, and, and traditional drugs or biologics. Diagnostics, it's, it's not uh, seen as a big enough market. It's not in, interesting enough. And so therefore, there hasn't been that much money pouring into this part. 
But on the other hand, the thing is that if you can't diagnose these, uh, th these diseases, you cannot create drugs to these diseases either, because then it's, there's no point. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what, what do you say? Um, <clears throat> I think that's certainly true. I think that um, what has changed is I think the people who are going to finance this are insurance companies. Mm. So I think that um, the use of diagnostics can, be, can save money. If you can put the right drug into the right person, then there's a massive cost, be it if you're a government or insurance company paying for that. And we've begun to see some evidence of um, some of the insurance companies in the States, the so-called managed care companies, beginning to sponsor clinical trials looking at diagnostics really as a way of saving money, not of sort of uh, uh, essentially determining is this drug safe, is this generic drug safe for people? Because a generic drug obviously is going to be a lot cheaper than a brand. Uh, so that's probably where the funding is going to come from. But it seems to me if we think about hi coming back to hype and reality, it seems to me the reality is we've got a lot of the tools for doing the analysis, if you like. We don't, and we might have, we have a bunch of markers that are sitting in our dictionary but the challenge seems to me is putting those together and actually validating sort of this set of markers is really good for diagnosing this disease. Mm -hmm. So if we come back to what you're doing in Stockholm Uppsala with sort of things like the biobank, mm -hmm. how important is that and sort of where, where, you know, what is going on in, in Sweden in that respect? I would just like to comment that, the, uh, that this human uh, proteum atlas, the, the human, uh, I don't know what it's called, protein atlas it's called, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, uh, the project uh, driven by uh, or started by Matthias Ulen, uh, which where, where they basically are looking at where every single protein in the body is located by immunohistochemistry and they're also comparing these with uh, different uh, cancer types and, uh, and uh, I worked for uh, the, the company Atlas Antibodies for a while and I know that they, they have been doing I mean, there's huge amount of uh, information coming every day, and what they're doing, they're basically screening and trying to see if there's some protein that is expressed highly in, in a certain cancer, and, and then preferably it's never expressed anywhere else. And uh, we did see the PSA that you mentioned there, and the PSA has a lot of noise there, and we found uh, much nicer candidates there. But uh, I don't know how that's progressing. I, I know that they're looking for funding and, and, and trying to uh, out-license these uh, different markers, and I think that's something that the, the Stockholm Uppsala region can, uh, I think that there will be a lot of different uh, nice markers coming out from that project. So it's the connection between the genes, the proteins, and the function of the proteins. Mm -hmm. That's sort of lots of data generated by the region right now, and used in drug development, uh, so it will have become reality also for drug development. Uh, so these tools are, are more than a list today, but um, sort of the connection is being established at this very moment, I would say. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> What's the connection between the research and the healthcare systems as they currently operate? Because it seems to me that there's a big question about, you know, we're going to understand lots of subtleties about the molecular nature, mm -hmm. and we're going to try and associate that with various diseases or states of health. Mm -hmm. But the system for diagnosing and treating people, which is a social and economic system, is basically orientated towards um, gross departures from normality. You, know, you, you don't just go along to the doctor when you slow down by 0.5 miles per hour or kilometers per hour <laughs> you're jogging. When you can't walk, you go to the doctor. When you've got an extreme pain, when you've got a lump, you know, how do you get to that? You know, what you're trying to do in, 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 in protein analysis is, is far beyond the subtlety that any system can cope with at the moment because the system is, operates entirely the other way around. You have to be very sick to get treated. I think the, the optimal thing to do would be to, once you have identified these markers, and then you come up with a technology that can identify these markers in, in, in the blood or, or some other easy, accessible uh, um, fluid. fluid, yes. Uh, uh, then then what, once, you, once you turn 40 or 30 or whatever, then you start uh, doing this kind of battery of tests. And, and, and then you do it every five years first, and then the older you get, the, the more often you do, so that you can detect these things early on before you can't walk. 
I think that's, that's the dream. That's how we thought uh, also that genomics would develop, that we would have a panel of things to test and know what diseases would afflict the person. But first of all, the genetics has turned out to be very complex for the more important diseases. Uh, and also in those cases where we are able to predict, like, uh, for instance, the uh, APOE gene uh, alleles of, in that locus will tell you whether you have a heightened risk of Alzheimer's, people don't necessarily want to know what's going to happen to them 40 years later. Uh, proteomics, I think, has an easier ride there because it's measuring what's going on at the time. It's not predicting mm -hmm. things farther into the future. And it sort of takes a, uh, it can uh, take an average measurement of uh, all the risk factors and looking at what is the outcome of that. So, so the, the hope, uh, I think we're preempting my presentation to some extent here, <laughs> but uh, the, the hope is that uh, it will be possible, uh, just as you suggest, I think, to test uh, people for disease anywhere in the body and predict that, that something may develop far before you really have symptoms of that and far before you have sustained uh, serious organ damage. But of course, you have to be around 10, 20 years here because the system that treats or diagnoses is not going to change that fast. No, I'm sure it's this will be a science. It's, it's the, it's the uh, but yeah. and I think, as, as Dan suggested, it may be other drivers uh, that push for that sort of new technology into the healthcare system, like the insurance companies. Because it's if we can have early health and uh, new diagnostic tools that will predict. Uh, that will definitely reduce the, the healthcare cost. Mm. Uh, so it, it's that sort of cost pressure. And, and if you think about a global perspective, there's so large unmet medical need in a global perspective. And if we start to treat uh, sort of <coughs> the developing countries to the same level as we treat people in Europe and US, we will not survive economically. So we need to, to move the healthcare systems into this sort of early health perspective. Mm. Otherwise, we would not survive um, financially. I, I think the other thing that's changing is, um, again, I, I was talking to the CEO of Humana this week, who's um, one of the large health insurers in the US. And they've got this concept of wellness. And what that means, it, essentially, it's preventative care. They realize that it's far too expensive to wait for people to get sick much better to stop them getting sick. And I think, if you like, the systems we have set up in the UK and US, uh, people are incentivized, or docs are incentivized, to prod people as much as possible because you get paid for prodding or doing anything to them. Um, in the UK, we have waiting lists. Let's keep our waiting list as short as possible. No one's measuring the quality, what's actually happening to the people we're treating, what's coming out the other end. And I think that's the shift we're seeing in healthcare provision from governments, and that may, I don't know if that's a five-year process or a 10-year process, but concomitant with that is this concept of, okay, if we're gonna to go to preventative care, the insurance companies need to make sure, okay, I'll give you, I'll cut your premium if you go to the gym each week, that sort of thing. Um, I met the CFO of Walgreens. Walgreens are now trying to build, again, a wellness model where you go into the pharmacy to pick up, I don't know, um, cough sweets or whatever, and you can get vaccinated for flu, you can get sort of all sorts of, uh, uh, they want to bring in diagnostics, uh, sort of related to this, you know, you're 40 years old, maybe you need this screening thing, which will, won't be, will be paid for out of pocket. And so you can see where, if you like, the funding for this is coming, you can see where that funding is going to come from. And it's not necessarily from government. And I think that sort of it's emerging when you get technology, economics is when these things become reality.